Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our series of presentations from the Kavli Institute for Paji at Stanford University, or as we call it, KIPAC for short, as we invite you to join us to discover our universe this evening. My name's Dan Wilkins. I'm an astrophysicist at KIPAC, and I'm the coordinator of our public talk series. And you can find out all about the public talks and the events we have going on over on our website at kipac.stanford.edu forward slash discover. Well, the big news in astronomy and our physics today is the announcement that the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics has been awarded to three prominent scientists who made breakthrough discoveries about black holes. Professors Roger Penrose, Reinhard Genzel, and Andrea Ghez. So on behalf of everyone at KIPAC, many congratulations to all three of them on their achievements. So we're really pleased tonight to have Dr. Krista Lynn Smith joining us, who herself is an expert on black holes, to tell us more about the different ways that we can study black holes and how they interact with the galaxies they live in. Krista was at Stanford from 2017, where she held NASA's prestigious Einstein Fellowship. But unfortunately for us, she's recently left us to take up a faculty position in the physics department at Southern Methodist University in her hometown of Dallas. Before she came to Stanford, she received her undergraduate degree in astronomy at the University of Texas in Austin and her PhD from the University of Maryland, where she worked jointly at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Krista's research focuses primarily on supermassive black holes and their host galaxies, but she's also published works and has ongoing interests in gamma ray bursts, star formation, and the habitability of exoplanets. Not only that, but she's a passionate advocate for equity and inclusion in physics and astronomy, and is dedicated to improving the accessibility and climate of our field for groups that have historically faced exclusionary practices and attitudes. Krista also styles herself an amateur home chef, a Dallas Cowboys fan and a lifelong Trekkie. So we're really excited to have Krista here tonight to tell us about black holes through the kaleidoscope. And if you have any questions for Krista, we'll be holding a Q&A after the talk. If you're joining us on Zoom, head down to the bottom of your screen and press the Q&A button. You can send in your questions there. Or if you're joining us over on YouTube, you can ask your questions in the chat window. But for now, I'll hand over to Krista. Thank you, Dan, and thank you everyone for joining me. Uh, to hear my discussion tonight about how we study black holes and how they interact with the galaxies in which they live. I've titled my talk Through the Kaleidoscope because as we will see, you need multiple colors uh, to fully understand this interaction and the physics surrounding black holes. But not only that, you need to see the relationship between these different colors and how they change over time. So I like to begin with just an introduction to the phenomenology of black holes. What we're looking at here is a gas cloud in space, and this is what we call a stellar nursery. And this gas cloud is self-gravitating, and eventually it becomes cool enough and heavy enough that it collapses under its own self-gravity. And when that happens, stars are born. Now, if the star that is born is sufficiently massive, and that means a few to a few dozens of times the mass of our sun, then it will live a relatively short life. And in astronomy terms, that's a few million years, paltry few million years. And then it will die in a catastrophic explosion called a supernova. And the remnant that's left over after that supernova explosion is a black hole. And it's a stellar corpse in some sense. You are probably familiar with space, with visualizations of space time like the two I'm showing now. You can think about it as a kind of three dimensional mesh rendered in two dimensions here. And a massive object like a star shown in the top graphic creates a warp in space time. And an object that orbits that star, say a planet, maybe the blue object, responds to that warp in the way that you see with an orbit. Now, in the case of a black hole, the distortion of space-time is much more dramatic than a simple well created by a star. And that's visualized in the graphic on the bottom. And in this graphic, you can see that it's a very severe space-time warp that goes kind of straight down to what we call the singularity. And in this case, if a particle gets too close, it doesn't orbit so much as fall in. So that's the phenomenology behind black holes from a space-time standpoint. We've talked about stellar black holes or stellar mass black holes, and that's the kind that results from the death of a star a few to tens of times the mass of the sun. 
there's another class of black holes called supermassive black holes. And these are millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. So 10 to the six is a million and 10 to the nine is a billion. And these are obviously much, much, much more massive than the stellar mass black holes. Now, recently, different observational techniques have begun to show us that there's possibly a class in between the stellar and supermassive black holes called intermediate mass black holes. And these would be a few tens to thousands of times the mass of the sun. Right now, these are much more rare than stellar and supermassive black holes, but we still don't know if that's because they actually are more rare or if because we're only just now developing the techniques that we need in order to study them and find them. Now we think that the deaths of massive stars like I showed you a moment ago is the origin point for stellar and intermediate mass black holes. However, the origin for supermassive black holes is still a major cosmic mystery that we're trying very hard to understand. But first let's start with what we do know about supermassive black holes. What we know is that they live in the centers of galaxies. And what you're seeing right now is a beautiful blue star forming spiral galaxy. It has a nice bar. Uh, that's the structure across the middle here. And this is probably what our Milky Way galaxy looks like. We, we can't leave the Milky Way and turn around and take a photo of it, obviously. But if we could, we think that it would look like this, a star forming barred spiral galaxy. And deep down in the center of the galaxy, at the location of that black box, but much littler than it, would be a supermassive black hole. We are quite pretty sure at this point that almost all the galaxies that we see, except for maybe some very small or irregular or dwarf galaxies, have a supermassive black hole living at the center. And our own Milky Way is no exception. If you are in the Northern Hemisphere and you go outside at night in the summertime and look to the south, what you will see is the constellation Scorpius and the constellation Sagittarius, which looks like a teapot and so is often called that way. In between those two constellations, you will see the swath of the Milky Way if you're in a sufficiently dark location. And in kind of the dark dusty middle of that, you'll be looking directly at the center of our galaxy or towards the center of our galaxy. And within that point is our central supermassive black hole, which we've named Sagittarius A star, abbreviated as SGR A star here. So you may be wondering how we know that's there. Now, we know it's there because of very beautiful work that has been done recently by scientists in Europe and scientists in California, uh, taking very careful measurements over a very long time with some of the biggest telescopes on the planet, watching the stars, these colored points, move around a center of mass that does not emit light, which is shown here by this white star. And I'm just gonna play this movie for you. And you can see in the top right of the movie, the years that it took to make this observation. And in fact, it spans of many years before this movie uh, starts. So it started in 1995, I believe. So you can see that these very smooth images of these stars are orbiting that point and using uh, the laws of orbital motion, we can calculate very precisely the mass of our supermassive black hole, which is 4.6 million times the mass of the sun. Now you heard me say that that point doesn't emit light. It's very, very dim. And in that case, we call a supermassive black hole quiescent. And 90% of the galaxies out there that have these supermassive black holes at the center, they are quiescent. But that's not always the case. Now, before we move on, I have to point out what Dan said at the beginning of this talk, that uh, this morning it was announced that the uh, discovery of the supermassive black hole at our galactic center won the Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, that was the work done by Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Ghez. Roger Penrose also shared a portion of the prize. He is a theorist, not an observer, but he studied the theory of relativity and found that black holes were an essentially inevitable consequence of Einstein's theory of relativity. And I wanna point out while we're on this slide that Andrea Ghez is the fourth woman to ever win the Nobel Prize in physics, the first female astronomer to win a Nobel Prize, and right now is the first time there have ever been two living female physics Nobel Prize winners at the same time. Donna Strickland won the prize in 2018. So very historic, much, much deserved. 
So what about that 10% of galaxies that aren't quiescent? In that case, there is some event that has funneled gas in towards the middle of that galaxy and right into the black hole. And the way that gas arrives in the black hole is it starts to lose angular momentum as it comes in and it forms this disk that we call the accretion disk. It's very hot, it's very magnetic, it's very turbulent, and the gas glows very brightly as it spirals into the black hole before it meets its end. Now, uh, the other pieces of the anatomy of this active, active nucleus, as we call it, is this kind of dusty torus. It's a donuts shaped object that sort of surrounds the accretion disk. And it's made up of these patchy dust clouds. And you can see from this image that if you looked at this from straight edge on, if you tilted it so you were looking at right along the edge, that that torus might keep you from seeing the accretion disk from some angles. The next important piece of this anatomy is the relativistic jet. The black hole at the center of this configuration is spinning. And that spinning black hole twists the magnetic field lines in such a way that it emits kind of a conical jet, a collimated jet that kind of shoots out of the galaxy perpen perpendicular to the accretion disk. And finally, very close to the black hole that kind of hovers over the black hole and the inner regions of the disk is an entity called the hot corona. And it emits in the X-rays, it's made up of highly uh, energetic electrons, a plasma, very similar to the sun's corona in that way. And if you want to hear a lot more about the corona, I advise you to uh, look at the KIPAC public lecture done a couple months ago by our esteemed host, Dan Wilkins, who goes into more detail on that. So this entire object, the accretion disk, the torus, the corona, the jet, we call this an active galactic nucleus. So it's not quiescent, it's active. And we abbreviate that as AGN. You may also have heard this object described as a quasar. And that's a historical term, and I will now uh, tell you why. So the discovery of AGN began mid-century in the 1950s and the 1960s. There was a mysterious object in the sky called a quasi-stellar radio source. And it was quasi-stellar because it looked like a star in the optical images. And you can see that in this image here. Uh, yes, you can see that in this image here because you can see these big diffraction spikes. And those diffraction spikes are a consequence of observing a point source with diffraction optics like in a telescope. So you can see this little star down here has them too. And they're radio sources. If you point radio telescopes at these sources, they glow very brightly in the radio. And stars don't usually do that. So in this sense, they're quasi-stellar radio sources. And we call those objects quasars. So that's an abbreviation of quasi-stellar radio source. In addition to being quasi-stellar radio sources, they had a bizarre spectrum with lines that don't match known wavelengths. So what does that mean? If you put the light of an object like a star through a, a slit or prism, you break that light up into a rainbow and you can plot it like in this spectrum here that's shown. The rainbow is the continuum at the bottom, the straight line base. And then you often see these very bright spikes shooting up. And these spikes come from different elements from the periodic table that are in the composition of that object, whatever's shining the light. And the location of these spikes corresponds exactly to a wavelength on this bottom scale here that is determined by its atomic properties. So we know exactly where it should lie. But interestingly, the lines in the spectra of these quasar sources didn't match up with anything we knew, with any of the elements on the periodic table, which was at first very confusing. But in 1963, uh, it was realized that the spectral lines are actually the lines of hydrogen, which is the best understood, most common element on the periodic table. But the reason they weren't at the location they were supposed to be is because they were red shifted. And so this graphic here, which I'll replay now in the bottom left, shows a source moving away from the man and the light is getting stretched as it moves away. So it's turning redder. Red light is lower energy, it has a longer wavelength. So I'll just play it again and you can see as it moves away from him, it stretches out its wavelength and becomes redder. And if we look on the right, you'll see five spectra of different AGN, different quasars, going from the nearest up the top to the farthest on the bottom. 
And these lines, you can see, scoot redder with each, uh, with, with the increasing distance. So they move, this, the location of those spikes changes. And that's called redshift. And what does that tell us? That tells us that these sources are moving away from us very quickly and that they're in other galaxies. They're not stars in our own galaxy. They're in other galaxies that are caught up in the expansion of the universe away from us. So the next piece of the puzzle came when Smith and Hoffley, also in 1963, made a plot of the brightness of one of these sources over time. So for about three years, which is the length of the time scale here, this is the time axis, they took a reading every so often of the brightness of the object with the telescope, and they can see that the brightness changes. And this plot is called a light curve. It's a plot of how the brightness of an object varies over time. And that word light curve is gonna come back again and again. Now, I'm going to show a simple equation. R is less than or equal to C times T. And R here is a distance or a size. C is a velocity or speed. And T is just time. So if the velocity C was 20 miles per hour and T was two hours, then you would go a distance of 20 miles per hour times two hours or 40 miles. In our problem, R is describing the size of the accretion disk, the distance that light has to travel through it. C is the speed of light and T is still just time. So you can see that if the T, if the time is quick, if the variability is rapid, then R must be small. And that goes to the next line of reasoning, which is that if it's gonna vary that quickly, all of that light coming from that quasi-stellar source has to be in a very small area. And if you do the math, it turns out that there's no way to explain that rapid variability in that small of an area with that much luminosity other than an accreting supermassive black hole. So all of those things taken together have given us the picture of accreting supermassive black holes in the centers of other galaxies, or AGN, active galactic nuclei. This is my favorite picture of an AGN ever drawn. It's an artist's rendition, but it's absolutely fabulous. You can see all the pieces I showed you before. The accretion disk is here. The dusty torus is this beautiful billowy cloud all around it. The relativistic jet is this pencil beam that's being fired out. And then the corona can be visualized sort of down here near the base of the jet. Now I'm showing you this beautiful image because each of these pieces of the puzzle, each piece of this object, it radiates light in a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the accretion disk tends to radiate in the optical and ultraviolet part of the spectrum. The corona and the very center of the object radiates in the X-ray. The dusty torus radiates in the infrared. And the jet, while also radiating at a lot of these other wavelengths, is very powerful in the radio and in gamma rays. So because each of these pieces of the puzzle has a different signature in the electromagnetic spectrum, we have to study them using different instruments. For the optical and the ultraviolet, we use traditional ground-based telescopes like the one I'm showing here, space-based timing instruments like this one here. It's not an imager, it's a, it measures light curves. And then the familiar Hubble Space Telescope. These are just representative examples of these types of instruments. Of course, there's many more space-based and ground-based telescopes. For the X-ray, we have space-based telescopes like Chandra and Swift, shown in these two images on the left, and then an instrument on the International Space Station called NICER. And we have to go into space to study things in the X-rays because the Earth's atmosphere keeps X-rays from hitting the Earth's surface. For radio uh, emission, we use these uh, dishes, which are sometimes single dishes and are sometimes in arrays. So you might recognize these telescopes here. This is the very large array in New Mexico, and it was uh, featured in the movie Contact. For infrared science, we can use ground-based telescopes as long as they're very, very high up on mountaintops because infrared light doesn't get too far down into our atmosphere. Or we can use space-based telescopes like Spitzer, which is shown here. Or, very cool, uh, we can use uh, infrared telescopes that are installed in airplanes. So this is uh, the SOFIA telescope that's installed in an airplane that flies while it takes observations. 
And finally, to study gamma rays, we must again use space-based instruments because they can't penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. And this is an image of the Fermi satellite. Again, there's lots more different uh, individual objects of these types, but these are kind of representative of, of the group and the ones that I use the most often myself. So it turns out that active galaxies are variable at all of these wavelengths. We can see variability in every wavelength, every piece of this electromagnetic spectrum that we look. So here is the optical light curve I showed you before taken at the Harvard Observatory. Here is the same object's light curve taken with a radio telescope and the same object's light curve taken with a gamma ray telescope. And you can see that in all three wave bands, the variability is there, it's, it's dramatic. So there's activity in physics to learn from each of these different instruments. In addition to being variable at all wavelengths, active galaxies are variable on a huge range of time scales. So I'm showing a couple of light curves on the left. This one is eight years long, and you can see the variability on probably weeks to months time scales happening here. This light curve on the bottom is only four hours long, and you can see variability on the time scale of a few minutes. And this discovery on the right shows a galaxy here, which is not an AGN anymore. It is a quiescent galaxy now. However, we know that it used to be an AGN because this cloud of gas that's glowing this kind of eerie looking green uh, entity here is 10,000 light years away. And that gas was irradiated. It was lit up by the active galactic nucleus that was active in this galaxy 10,000 years ago. So it traveled that far lit up the, uh, the gas cloud here. And then eventually it turned off and cooled. We don't know exactly when that happened, but this galaxy, or this stuff over here could not have been irradiated and lit up like that any other way. So it's cooling down now too. But that tells us that the, the activity in this kind of object varies also over thousands of years time scales because it's not on right now. And throughout the talk, look in the bottom right corner or any corner of the screen that shows these little pictures shows the types of instruments we use to do the work in the actual slide. So having discussed light curves, I can now tell you about time domain astronomy. And I'm showing this image of uh, starry night because famously you can get a sense of motion when you look at the sky in this image. And that's really how astronomy has transitioned in the past decade or two is away from these beautiful static images of the sky, of these galaxies you know, that don't change for millions of years and into a much more dynamic picture of things that are changing all the time. And this slide just shows a few examples of what those are like. So we know that stars pulsate. They have a kind of acoustic oscillations inside them that cause them to pulsate. Uh, they also pulsate because they're about to die. Uh, and they do die, and we sometimes see those as supernovae, like we discussed before, which are flashes in the sky. We can see bright flashes from more exotic events. There was a, the first discovery of, a of two neutron stars that collide together, uh, which caused the flash that you see here in the left in the discovery image, and then a few days later, it is starting to fade in another galaxy there. Tidal disruption events, where a supermassive black hole uh, rips a star apart. So sometimes a star doesn't peacefully orbit the way it did with ours. Sometimes it gets a little too close and gets shredded. And then you have a flare from that event, which I'll talk about a little bit more at the end. Uh, these are just a few examples. There's many, many more, but time domain astronomy has really come into its own and massive ground-based instruments are being set up to, to take advantage of this and to uh, transform our dynamic image of the sky. So I've told you about the instruments that we use and about time domain astronomy. Using that, what have we learned about the jet and the accretion disk around supermassive black holes? I'm showing here a little bit of my own work. This is the Kepler instrument, the Kepler Space Telescope. And if you follow astronomy news, you're much more familiar with Kepler because of its discovery of exoplanets, which it did fabulously well. But in order to find exoplanets, it stared at one piece of the Milky Way, one patch of the sky for a very long time, for four years. And every 30 minutes for that entire length of time, it took a brightness reading of the objects that it was looking at. And on the right are my light curves from the Kepler uh, Space Telescope of three different AGN that just show you how different they can be. So in the top 
we have very rapid variability happening over about three, three years of data. In the middle, we have an object that doesn't look like it's doing much of anything. We would think that it was quiescent maybe for a long time, almost a year. And then there's a major event that we're still studying. We're not sure what this is. Uh, and then it returns to this state where it's, it's not really varying very much. And then there's objects like the one in the bottom that have a little bit of both. They have rapid variability, but they also have this baseline with sort of a discrete events that occur within them. And there's a lot of kind of nitty gritty physics here, but what we can learn from large samples of these light curves is uh, about the turbulence and viscosity of accretion disks, about the magnetic fields and what happens within them. A lot of magnetic events can cause the kind of flares that you see here and how the dynamics of these disks uh, evolves as the rate of matter falling in changes. So there's a lot of interesting physics to be gathered from these uh, accretion disk light curves. If we move on to telescopes with lots of different colors, we can learn more. So the Kepler telescope has just one big filter. It's just white light, all the light, all the visible wavelengths of light just straight through. But if we use, the diff if we use different colors, we can study the uh, structure of the accretion disk in more detail. So this is a very nice study that uh, starts in the x-rays in the top panel. This is an x-ray light curve, so is the red one. And then it moves through the ultraviolet in kind of the purple and blues, and then the colors you're more familiar with, like the sort of optical, uh, optical colors from orange through red. Now, what we see if we look at these light curves, and on the right-hand side of this plot is showing kind of the average middle of the variability, that's zero lag or this, this gray line that goes up through it, and whether the variability came before or after. And all you need to know is that these events, these kind of flares, move through the rainbow from the x-rays all the way to the red visible. So it starts over here before the middle time, and then it goes over here to after, and oops, excuse me. And why does it do that? Well, remember the corona, which is this blue kind of star-shaped thing here, it's an x-ray radiator. It radiates in the x-rays, and so it is responsible for these light curves at the top, the x-ray light curves. And if it varies, then some of that light falls down onto the accretion disk, it shines onto the disk, and it's reprocessed by the disk. And the gas that's here in the inner parts of the disk radiates in the ultraviolet, it's hotter, and as you move outward in the disk, the gas radiates at lower and lower temperatures until you get out to the outer regions where it's quite cool and, and somewhat red. So it will reach this part first. So first the X-ray varies, that's the top light curve. Then the reprocessed light from the ultraviolet parts of the disk, then the sort of greener parts, and then the far out redder parts. And then we see this nice progression of this flare moving through the rainbow in that way in our telescopes on up, up, uh, up on Earth. So that's very nice. Uh, however, it's not quite that simple. If you do it for lots of different objects, you sometimes see these nice progressions, but sometimes you have objects like this one on the far left where it's more complicated. It's not obvious. The X-ray seems to come later than some of the optical uh, variability. So the picture is not so clean and a few reasons why that might be are shown in these images. So on the top left, this is a supercomputer simulation of an accretion disk. And you can see it's not just a perfect, you know, re reprocessor. It's not a perfect little mirror that just re-radiates exactly what gets shot off of it. It's a, it's a dynamic object with a dense core and it gets less dense as you go out and it's always changing and, this, and turbulent and moving. And in addition, this pretty picture on the right of a nice thin flat accretion disk is probably not valid for uh, all of all disks all the time. There are different states of the accretion disk shown in the bottom panel on the left. And sometimes in some states, the uh, disk might form these kind of puffy interior regions that prevent uh, perfect reprocessing and even prevent some of the light from the corona from getting to the inner parts of the disk. So there's a lot of more complexity here and studying larger and larger samples with multi multicolored light curves will give us a little bit more insight into doing this. And that's now underway uh, in a lot of groups all over the world. Fortunately, very recently, again, speaking about all over the world, we have been able for the first time to actually image the accretion flow around a supermassive black hole. 
to image what happens to photons as they, as they uh, orbit a supermassive black hole. So uh, you're very familiar, I'm sure, with this famous image from the press, the first picture of a black hole taken by the Event Horizon uh, telescope collaboration. And this nice handy video on the top right shows us why it looks like a ring. Those are photons that are getting lensed by the black hole. So they're traveling through that space-time warp and getting bent around it. Just like if you were to flick a marble around those machines at the museum, it wouldn't go straight. The funnel machines where you put the coins in, it doesn't go straight. It goes across and then it starts to kind of bend before it goes around the other side. That's what's happening here. It's called gravitational lensing. And in the vicinity of the black hole this close, it's extreme. So we're seeing photons from behind the black hole, from around the black hole, uh, and that's why it looks the way it does. And this was a huge global effort. The bottom panel shows the telescopes in the world that were involved with this. There's even one on the South Pole. Uh, so this is the first time we've been able to do this, and this is still very actively being researched. Uh, the implications of this image are not even remotely fully mined yet. People are working on this uh, very intently, but there's even more to come. So this is the first object that this telescope has imaged. The next object and the one we're all really waiting for very uh, with, great, with great anticipation is an image of the of Sagittarius A star, the Milky Way's black hole. So that's coming. We, they keep telling us it's coming. Uh, we're all very excited to see uh, the results for our own black hole, but there are other quasars that will be less high resolution than this, lower resolution, but still very exciting coming up in, the, in future years. And the Event Horizon Telescope will expand. Other stations are planned, even some perhaps in orbit. Before we move on, I want to talk about a special class of AGN called a blazar, which we can use to study the jet. So a blazar is a special situation where the AGN is oriented with respect to Earth in such a way that we're not looking sort of sideways or at the accretion disk, but the barrel of the jet is pointing directly at Earth. And this is quite rare, but it does happen in some cases. And in that case, we're looking down the barrel of the jet and all the variability that we see tells us about the jet, not the accretion disk. So these are different physical processes that we can learn about. And on the right, I'm showing just an example. This is again from the Kepler satellite. The red triangles here are the actual data. So that's the light curve. And this group has been able to model those flares in the, in the, in the light curve with these kind of black swooping shapes, which they uh, derive from theor theoretical considerations as orbiting features in a helical jet. So this bottom right graphic shows the black hole jet, the twisted magnetic field lines we talked about before. And as the particles move up through that helical structure, they're kind of orbiting the core of the jet. And that is consistent with what we see here. Now, just like we can use multicolors to study the disk, we can do that to study the jet as well. We are not actually sure yet whether the exact same physical processes in a jet give rise to the X-rays, the gamma rays and X-rays and the radio emission from the jet. It's possible that they do. There's theories that say they do and there's theories that say that the processes are different, but perhaps related. Now it's, it's clear that if the same things happening in the jet are causing both the optical and X-ray and radio emission and the gamma ray emission, that their light curve should look the same. So people have studied uh, these objects using simultaneous light curves in different wave bands. This is a study of my own that shows the optical light uh, and the gamma ray light showing similar features. This is a study I, I co-authored this, this past year that shows uh, the X-rays behaving similarly to the infrared and the optical at the same time. So these, these are nice examples. The data are usually not quite as clean, but in, in general, it looks like there is a relationship between those two emitting regions. Now, uh, binary supermassive black holes are a natural consequence of some other observations that we've seen in the universe. So we can ask the question, what happens when two galaxies hosting supermassive black holes merge together? We know from beautiful images with Hubble like these on the left that galaxies merge all the time. We see galaxy mergers at various stages of separation near the end of the merger. And if all of these galaxies have supermassive black holes in the middle, well, naturally, the result of this merger would be a binary supermassive black hole at the end of the process. 
So what happens there? This is an artist's rendition on the right of a binary supermassive black hole. This is a supercomputer simulation visualizing what happens in that process. And what we think occurs is that each black hole has its own accretion disk and they're both embedded in a cavity in a much larger disk that we call the circumbinary disk. And it feeds those inner accretion disks with these kinds of streamers. Now, these, or these black holes are orbiting one another still. And so you can imagine that as that happens, these streamers will eventually collide with one another and that will proceed in a periodic way as the orbit proceeds. And those collisions can cause flares. So we might think that there would be periodicity in the light curve. And people have gone and looked for this. Uh, over the past several years, there have been a lot of uh, candidate binary supermassive black holes put forward. These are just a few, some better than others. Uh, this is promising. And uh, with these large ground-based surveys I referred to before that are gonna do a lot more in terms of gathering light curves, there will be many, many more of these in coming decade. However, we have to be a little bit careful because if you remember those AGN light curves I showed you before from Kepler, it's easy for something to sort of look like it has a periodicity and then completely change. So there is a danger here, but there's a lot of work being done to, to do better vetting of these candidates. There is another possible signature of a binary supermassive black hole. Here again is just an image of what that might look like as they orbit one another. And on the right, I'm showing a visualization of gravitational lensing again. So when a foreground object like this gray object passes in front of a background light source, it can lens the light around it gravitationally like we saw in the Event Horizon Telescope graphic. And that causes a flare in the light curve, which you can see in the inset. In our case for this configuration, the foreground object is the black hole that's passing in front from our perspective. And the background object is the black hole and its accretion disk behind. So the observational consequence of this from a, theor from a theoretical standpoint looks like this. You have the periodicity of the light curve like we discussed before, but on top of that, because the viewing angle gets it where you can see this flash, this lens flash, every passage you see a flare from the lens superimposed upon that. And one of the objects from the Kepler field, one of my Kepler AGN, has a signature that looks very much like this. So this green line is the same model on the left fitted for our candidate and the black data points are the light curve. So there is at least one candidate lensing supermassive black hole binary. Uh, this is the first candidate I believe that existed. There might be another one now, uh, but again, we might look forward to having more of these in the future. I'll deviate just a little bit here from light to talk about what's been in the news with black holes, and I'm sure you, many of you have, have heard the news, uh, are binary stellar mass black holes and their mergers. So this is a picture of the LIGO instrument. It's in uh, Oregon and Louisiana. This is the Oregon detector, I think. Uh, and the way this works is that you have these two very, very long um, baselines, three or several kilometers in this case. And, uh, and those are designed to detect what we call gravitational waves. So when two black holes merge together, they cause ripples in that space-time fabric. And similar to, to ripples you would see in a pond. And the stellar mass black holes cause ripples that are rapid enough, and that's the stretching and, uh, and squishing of space-time or those ripples as they move out through space, that when they reach the Earth, they actually change the distance between uh, the central kind of node here and these far away uh, baselines. And they fire lasers back and forth uh, here and they reflect off of mirrors. And the distance it takes, or the time it takes those lasers to move between the mirrors changes if the distance is shorter, shortened or lengthened. So using this method, we've actually found a lot of stellar mass black hole mergers. This was, sorry, predicted by general relativity. Uh, and this plot just shows those mergers. So up here, these purple dots are the stellar mass black holes that we know about. And then we can see two of them uh, merging to form a, a daughter black hole that is a little bit more massive. And you can see a bunch of these. These are the stellar graveyard um, that LIGO has discovered so far, uh, black hole mergers in the stellar mass regime. I will stress here that gravitational waves are a new messenger. They are not light waves. So they're not electromagnetic waves from the spectrum like we've been talking about before. 
they're an entirely independent and complementary way of exploring the universe. Now, we also want to do this with supermassive black holes. The issue is that the ripples they cause in space-time are much more ponderous. They're long and slow, and the, the distortions on space-time are, are on much larger scales. So it's harder to detect them with the LIGO detectors, which are too short. So the answer is to build a bigger one, a much, much bigger one. And that's going to be done by launching uh, these satellites into space. And the baseline between the, between the mirrors, where they're filed fire these lasers, is now uh, millions of kilometers instead of a few. This is a diagram of the orbit of the Earth and what that uh, might look like. This is the LISA mission. It's scheduled for launch in the early 2030s. It's something I'm working on with the NASA, uh, NASA science working group. Uh, and on the right, people are impatient. So they don't want to wait for Lisa. Let's look for uh, these long period gravitational waves now. And there's a very clever experiment happening as we speak uh, to look for this. There are these objects that are out there uh, in, in space around the Earth, you know, far out in the galaxy, called pulsars. These are rapidly spinning neutron stars that flash at extremely precise intervals, like millisecond precision intervals. And we can time those out very, 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 very precisely. And we know where they're all located, sort of in this you know, map around the Earth in different directions. So if one of these slow space-time waves moves through that region, it can affect how we see those pulses, how quickly we see those pulses or how slowly we see those pulses. And then by mapping all of those different things together and, and timing all those different pulsars, we can see how that wave affects it and kind of piece together its direction and its shape. And that's the pulsar timing array or nanograv, which is the more pulsars we discover, the better. And we don't know that many yet, just a dozen or so. And so we're gathering more, more of these uh, well-timed millisecond style pulsars as much as we can, discovering them so that we can build this map better. And in the next decade, it's expected that, that this will bear fruit. So those are some ideas for how to look for supermassive black hole binary mergers without using the electromagnetic spectrum. So we've talked about what we've learned using all these instruments and techniques about the black holes themselves, the accretion disks and the jets, but what about how black holes interact with their host galaxies? Again, as I said at the beginning, we believe that all of the galaxies you can see here, all these beautiful spirals and ellipticals, these have supermassive black holes at their center. And you can see a lot of different colors here, colors and shapes. Blue galaxies are probably forming stars actively. They're relatively young galaxies. And these big kind of red ovals are elliptical galaxies and they're mostly made up of old stars. There's not a lot of new star formation happening in those objects. So why do we see such a huge diversity of colors and shapes of galaxies when we look at the universe? It turns out that AGN are likely to be a big part of that. And that's easy to understand when you look at images like this, where we are now zoomed way out from the AGN, and instead we're looking out at the host galaxy, and we make composite images of the host galaxy we would see with our own eyes, which is you know this kind of starry spiral under here, and this kind of dusty, disky galaxy here. Um, and then we use the other wavelengths superimposed upon them to see things as though we could see the entire electromagnetic spectrum. This image on the left has radio jet in the kind of multicolored rainbow and the optical image we discussed before. And you can see this jet caused by the AGN is humongous compared to the galaxy. On the right, similar situation, you can see the beautiful galaxy in the background. Then in the purple, we have X-ray emission from the Chandra X-ray telescope. Uh, and then we have radio emission and uh, ionized gas emission in the red and purple, or uh, the kind of hot pink. So you can look at these images and realize that there's no way these powerful jets that are plowing through these galaxies are not having an effect on the galaxy itself. And indeed, we think they're having a very important effect. So if we take all the galaxies out there, like in that multicolored picture I showed you a moment ago, and we make a plot of them in this space. So the color going from blue to red here, and low mass galaxies to high mass galaxies, very large galaxies here. Then the contours are what we see. We see a lot of galaxies that are 
kind of small and blue, and a lot of galaxies that are pretty big and red. And there's kind of this empty space in the middle that people call the Green Valley. Now remember that most of these, that all these galaxies, most of these galaxies, 90%, don't have AGN in the middle. They just have quiescent black holes doing nothing. Now, if you plot the host galaxies of active AGN on this plot, they seem to kind of sit in this Green Valley, which is odd. So one idea that came out of this is maybe the AGN are turning these blue star forming galaxies down here, like this one, into these quiescent, uh, into these kind of red and dead, as we call them, galaxies that are old and not forming stars anymore. So AGN may be turning off the star formation and changing blue galaxies into red galaxies. And that's why we see them in the middle here, because that's as the galaxy is making its transition. This is the process we call AGN feedback. And there's a few different reasons why we think this might proceed. And I'm gonna focus on two of them here. This is another a supercomputer simulation that shows the disk of the galaxy in blue and kind of green here. This is the galaxy disk, not the accretion disk. Now we're zoomed way, way, way out from that. This is the disk of the galaxy, like the Milky Way galaxy, like that blue spiral from the beginning. And the AGN is way down here in the middle. And the blue is kind of cold gas that's dense and sort of mining its own business. And the farther down the scale you get to the red, the, the gas is hotter and more turbulent. And the jet that is ejected by the supermassive black hole is doing two things in this simulation. First, you can see quite clearly that it's just pushing the gas out of the galaxy. The gas is getting shot out. And if the gas isn't there, it can't collapse and form stars. Remember from the very beginning of the talk, Stars are formed when gas clouds become cool enough that they collapse. Now, if the gas is just booted out of the galaxy, it's not gonna collapse, no stars. Similarly, if the gas is heated sufficiently, and you can see these around the center here, these gases getting into the green zone here, if it's, if it's heated, even if it's still in the galaxy, it won't get cool enough to collapse under its own gravity. Both of those things will shut off the star formation. So we have theoretical reasons why this transition from the blue galaxies to the red galaxies might occur, a process known as AGN feedback. Some of the work that I do looks at whether even kind of wimpy jets might be able to do this because most of the jets are not the glorious ones that I showed in the, in the previous slide. They're definitely there, but they're a little small. So on the left, I'm showing some optical images. Again, on the top right, you can see the instruments used. Uh, the optical images of galaxies in the red, and then the blue contours are from the very large array. These are radio images, and that's showing the, the outflow or the jet driven by the supermassive black hole. And in some of these cases, especially this one here, the jet is pretty puny. So could it really be forcing that transition? And over here is a plot of the rate of star formation in the galaxy, how rapidly the galaxy is able to form stars versus its mass. And the gray dots are inactive galaxies, quiescent galaxies without an AGN. And the triangle symbols are galaxies in my sample that have these relatively small radio jets. They do have AGN. And you can see that the rate of star formation in those galaxies is lower than the galaxy population that does not have an AGN in it. So even these weak jets appear to be having an effect on their host galaxies. Now, if we zoom out even farther, so we've zoomed out from the central region that shows the AGN to the host galaxy, we can take a step even farther back and look at the cluster in which the galaxy lives. So galaxies tend to live in groups. They're social creatures and they like to live in these uh, in galaxy clusters. So here's just an image of a galaxy cluster and it's bound by gravity, the mutual gravity of all those galaxies. And there's usually a galaxy in the cluster that's big and important and it's the most luminous and most energetic. And it, if it has an AGN, that AGN can have a profound effect on the cluster. So this middle image is showing a galaxy cluster and uh, this AGN hosting galaxy is sort of in the center here. And in this image, the blue light is X-ray emission, and that's caused by hot gas that fills the cluster. And this is quite common. Clusters are full of this very hot gas called the intercluster medium, and it radiates in the X-rays. 
But what's important to see here is that this red emission, which is the radio emission from the AGN, the jet in other words, is blowing bubbles in the X-ray gas that fills the cluster. It's evacuating the gas out of the cluster. So it's not just having an effect on its own host galaxy. It's also changing the environment for the entire cluster. Now, unfortunately for us, the scientists who did these studies chose basically backwards color schemes for each other. So I've provided some arrows to help you understand. As I said, the red emission in this image is the radio jet and the blue is the X-ray gas. In this image, the X-ray gas is shown by the colors in the background and the radio emission is shown by the green contours. And we can see the same thing, that the cavities in the X-ray gas are evacuated by the radio emission from the AGN. So two examples, there are others. Uh, these are the prettiest and most colorful. Uh, two examples of radio uh, emission, powerful jets from the AGN evacuating cavities uh, in the cluster medium and affecting the environment much beyond their own hosts. I want to point out a really cool fact that's relatively recent discovery is that our own Milky Way may once have been an AGN. So if you recall earlier in the talk, I showed you an example of a galaxy that is inactive now, but that we know used to be active because it irradiated this patch of gas that was 10,000 light years away. Our own galaxy appears to have also once been an active galaxy, even though our black hole is currently quiescent. And this was discovered using the Fermi telescope in gamma rays. So up in the right is the image of Fermi. And this is a gamma ray map of the sky. And it's the entire sky as seen from the surface of the Earth. And the Milky Way is this band at the center. And then this is a gamma ray map. So in the Milky Way's plane, you can see lots of sources. There are gamma ray sources that live in the Milky Way. That's to be expected. But you can also see these bright emission in these kind of two bubbles that pop up uh, above and below the plane right where the galactic center is located. And this graphic on the right makes it a little clearer. Here's the Milky Way and here uh, is a visualization of those gamma ray bubbles. And we think these are fading echoes of the kinds of outflows that we saw before in those two spectacular images. Now they're cooling and through some, some radiative physics on how they're cooling, we think that this was about 3 million, 4 million years ago, if this was the case. So the Milky Way itself may once have been an AGN and may have been subject to some of these feedback effects. So you may be thinking that's very nice, but you just said that only 10% of galaxies are active and every way that you've shown that we study these supermassive black holes is in these active galaxies. That's true. And we have to hope that the active galaxies are representative of the larger population. And we think that that's true because we think that galaxies like the Milky Way go in and out of being AGN. However, recently a means of studying quiescent black holes has presented itself and that's tidal disruption events. So briefly, when I introduced the time domain, I mentioned stars getting eaten by black holes. And you remember the video of the stars orbiting our own supermassive black hole, not falling in, just orbiting peacefully. Well, occasionally, shown in, in this cartoon on the left, a star gets uh, a little too close. And when that happens, it gets tidally shredded by gravitational tides and it forms an accretion disk around the black hole. So this is a, just a nice animation of that phenomenon. The black hole now you can barely see in the bottom left of the image. Here comes the star and it becomes shredded, tidally distorted, and then it falls in, creating a temporary accretion disk, which launches a jet. Now it's temporary because eventually all that gas will either fall into the black hole or be blown away by the radiation coming from the, act, from the activity. And so that will fade. Uh, however, for that brief time, which can be months to years, we see that whole process unfold. The shredding of the star, the formation of the disk, the formation of the jet. And this is exemplified in uh, this image here, which is again, a multi-wavelength, multi-color image going from the optical in the red in the bottom up through the optical colors to the ultraviolet in the purple and pink up here. And this is using space-based and ground-based telescopes. And you can see that it's doing nothing, has no emission really. 
And then we can see the, the glow beginning in all these different bands. So very exciting uh, studies. We only have a, a few of these objects so far, but as I said before, regarding the binaries, these new time domain surveys are gonna bring many more of these to light. And so we'll get to watch this process in real time. So I've told you about supermassive black holes, which occupy the centers of almost all galaxies in the universe and have profound effects on the evolution of galaxies and the appearance of the universe, the colors of those galaxies and their distribution. And that in order to really understand this, our species must use all of our resources around the world and in space collaboratively to get a full picture of these powerful and mysterious objects. And with that, I will thank you for your attention and be happy to take your questions. Well, thank you so much, Krista. It's amazing when we think about black holes and something that might sound like science fiction, that they're real. We can go out and look at many, many black holes across our universe. And not only that, but we can look at these black holes and study these black holes in so many different ways and just learn so much about them. Um, so just to get us started um, with the audience questions, um, can you give us an idea of how many black holes we know of in the universe and how many we study on a regular basis? Sure. So that depends a lot on the type of black hole we're talking about. Uh, stellar mass black holes are very, very common. They outnumber supermassive black holes in theory because there's lots more stars than there are galaxies and a lot of them are dying and forming these black holes. But they're small and they can be isolated floating around in the galaxy. And so we don't know of that many of them. We, we can't find them as easily. So we actually only know of uh, many dozens of these stellar mass black holes. Supermassive black holes, however, we have a lot more of. We have millions of AGN that we're aware of at this point uh, and that we study actively in large surveys. So it, the sample is enormous. Intermediate mass black holes, we don't have too many, just a few at the moment, uh, but that's probably, or, or in my opinion, is likely to be because we're only just developing the techniques that we need to locate them. They may be as numerous as the others, but we're not sure. Yes, I guess the, the difficult thing with black holes is that by definition, they're black. Nothing can escape them. No light comes out the black hole. So to see a black hole, we need to catch it doing something, whether that's swallowing some of the gas like you showed in an accretion disk or colliding with another black hole so that we can feel the, the gravitational waves coming from it. Right, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and there are lots of accreting supermassive black holes out there. Stellar mass black holes can accrete if they're close to a companion star that they're sort of siphoning material off of. Um, but it's, it's it, even if they are, they're so much dimmer than the, the supermassive black holes that it's not easy to see them. And we can't see them in very many other galaxies because of the great distance. We need the luminosity of the supermassive nucleus to see something in another galaxy. Yeah. And so you showed um, that amazing evidence, actually, that maybe even the black hole in our own galaxy at one point was um, an active galaxy. It was producing this incredible source, maybe even launching jets like some of the quasars and AGN that you showed. Is there any sort of intrinsic difference between the black hole in our galaxy and the ones in other galaxies? Or do we think that that this is a common feature that happens in the history of all galaxies? We think it's common to all galaxies. So our black hole is relatively puny, a few million solar masses, but the really big guys, the billion solar mass black holes, those are probably rare. Um, our galaxy is pretty typical, it's relatively boring. And we think that galaxies turn on and off their black holes. This can happen for lots of reasons. It can happen because galaxies merge with each other that can cause a situation where it pushes gas into the center and turns on the AGN. The Milky Way's own activation was probably because of a dwarf galaxy that got eaten, so not a huge merger like those Hubble images that I showed. But the Milky Way didn't really get that bothered by it, except that it kind of passed through and dumped some gas, and then it got shredded, and that gas might have turned on our own black hole. And so, uh, so that's a, probably a very common event. It's probably happens a lot that bigger galaxies like ours eat these little dwarfs that orbit them all the time and then maybe they turn on for a little while. 
Yeah, so whether a black hole is uh, turned on, if you like, or not, really depends on if there's any gas nearby for it to um, for it to swallow, right? For it to extract the energy out of, and it can um, it can turn on if gas comes by, but then once it's swallowed all that gas, it's going to to turn off again, right? Um, so one of the um, the things you talked about, I mean, the radiation coming from the jets around this black hole was um, gamma radiation. Um, now, when people think about gamma rays, they often think about nuclear radiation um, and the potential health consequences for that. So one of the questions we had was um, if radiation from a, coming from a supermassive black hole were to hit the Earth, would it be a danger to us? Well, it could be bad, uh, but we don't need to worry about black holes in other galaxies. So these blazars that are facing us, the jet pointing at us, they're so far away. It's not even remotely possible that that would be a danger. However, um, if the Milky Way's own black hole turned on and the jet was pointed towards us, that would be bad. And uh, there has been some, <laughs> there has been some uh, there have been some very interesting studies since the discovery of the Fermi bubbles about the consequences for habitability. Now it can't have wiped all life out because we're here and it was only three or 4 million years ago. So there was life on earth at that time, but we don't know, you know, that the picture I showed, it made it look like that radiation was oriented perpendicular to the galaxy and we're way out on the edge. So probably it wouldn't have been a huge deal, but some of that X-ray radiation from the center might have had consequences for habitability of some life forms on Earth. Uh, if it was, or, now there's no reason, I didn't mention this before, but there's no reason why the AGN has to be pointed perfectly perpendicular to the galaxy. Inside the galaxy, it can be pointed lots of different ways. So if it was pointed in a really unfortunate direction that the, a powerful jet was ejected towards the Earth, yeah, that would, that would not be good. <laughs> Yeah, but I guess uh, fortunately we'd get a bit of warning if any large amount of gas was getting towards the black hole because we've been studying it so closely recently. Yes, we to, saw turn the on, to turn on an event of that magnitude, we would know it was coming. There, there are gas clouds that scientists are watching with great interest as they approach Sagittarius A star, but not with fear. Uh, they just want to see what happens, you know, when they fall in and what kind of radiation is produced. They're not nearly big or dense enough to cause a, a true AGN. Yeah, um, so we, we see these little clouds of gas coming in and then instead of getting scared because they're just small clouds of gas, we actually get really excited that we, we all learn point our telescopes at them and watch intently. <laughs> yes, I remember um, a few years ago now, there was a, a moderate size gas, but a, a pretty decent one that should have produced quite a lot of light that was heading straight towards um, the black hole in the center of our galaxy. It was called G2. Um, so we all excitedly pointed our telescopes at it and uh, lo and behold, nothing happened. So we'll have yeah, to wait for the next one. It was kind of a kind of a, a nothing burger on that one, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but of course, these um, these quasars and these AGN do have a profound effect on the galaxies they live in. You showed how they can turn off the star formation in a galaxy. I um, mean, this power output is enough to, to stop the growth of a galaxy and to really govern how galaxies and how structure forms in our universe. And um, could you say a few more words about how we measure that star formation to, to see the black hole having this effect? Yeah, absolutely. So we can use uh, radio images to see the jet of the AGN, but it turns out that star formation regions and galaxies also emit radio uh, radiation. And that's for a few different reasons, uh, but we can see uh, patches of radio emission that surround the, the galaxy that sometimes follow the spiral arms or that are sort of concentrated around the nucleus. And that tells us where the star formation is occurring. We can also use blue light. So I talked about how blue light shows us that uh, there's a lot of young stars somewhere because they tend to be blue and hot. They also radiate in the ultraviolet quite well. So we can trace the star formation by taking an ultraviolet image of a galaxy. So radio and ultraviolet images. Uh, also those, those emission lines in the spectrum, those spikes in the spectrum from the beginning of the talk, star formation also causes uh, certain high amounts of different elements like hydrogen, the, the first ionized state of hydrogen, hydrogen alpha, um, that, that are very powerful in star forming regions. So we can take a, a map of that very narrow region of the spectrum, just the spike, 
using Hubble filters that can only take a picture of that one wavelength and see where in the galaxy that signature is prominent. So there's lots of complementary ways to map the star formation in the same way that we map the AGN outflow. Yeah. And, and how do we think that that supermassive black hole forms and gets into the center of the galaxy? Is, there, is that quite an active area of research at the moment? Boy, is it ever. Um, so as I said at the beginning, we don't know how they form. And there's a reason I never circled back to give you that answer. Uh, we don't actually know the origin of supermassive black holes. Uh, we do know that they were supermassive really, really early. Um, so much earlier in the universe, we can look back in time by looking at further and further away objects. And we know that very early in the history of the universe, galaxies had huge black holes at the center much earlier than they should uh, in terms of if we wanted to grow them from little black holes all the way up to the big ones. It can't be done uh, in that time scale from the beginning of the universe. So something happened at the beginning to form what we call the seeds, uh, the primordial seeds of the black holes. Some ideas are a single star that was a million solar masses that lived for the blink of an eye and then collapsed because it was so big it couldn't sustain itself. Some ideas involve the direct collapse of a cloud that never becomes a star, it just poof, straight down. It's sort of the leftover gas, if you like, that falls into the center of the galaxy. Yeah, and, and so, so, but there are different predictions in the present universe that those two different models make that we're trying to test, but it's still very much up in the air. We don't know. Yeah. And I guess that was actually one of the most surprising things we found um, just over the last few years, as you say, just how early on in our universe the black holes had got that big. And we, we had these ideas of how long it, we think it takes to grow a black hole that's a million or a billion solar masses, and they're already there way before they should have had time to form. So, uh, yeah, still a, a big mystery and a big area of research. Very much so. And so the um, data you showed um, showed observations coming from um, multiple different satellites and telescopes on the ground at all different wavelengths or different colors of light. Um, how complicated is it to coordinate looking at the same black hole with all of those different instruments on the ground and up in space? Well, it's quite, it's quite difficult um, and it sort of depends on, on what framework you're operating in. So if you're like me, um, most projects, I find something interesting in the sky and then I have to write proposals to many different entities. Uh, so the, there's people that control each of those instruments, time allocation groups. And so I have to write my case explaining the science that I want to do to the very large array, to Chandra, um, to Hubble, and then ask them to give me the time. Now you can do that uh, and you can or you can try to do it so that they all give you the time at the same time, which is even harder. <laughs> so um, if you want to get those images that are all simultaneous or those light curves that are simultaneous, uh, that requires the observatories to coordinate and they all have their own schedules too. So that's quite challenging. Now there are, what, what I mean by frameworks is there are these large collaborations of people that intentionally work together to make this happen quickly. So when we have a, a LIGO signal of a merger of, of something interesting, and if it can be localized on the sky, there's a collaboration in place that kind of sends a trigger to all these observatories to do this all at once. So someone wrote a proposal in the past to create that collaboration and that entity. Uh, but yes, it can be very challenging, but the astronomy community is very collaborative and super helpful. Even if you don't have time to write a proposal, most of the instruments have what, a, what's called a target of opportunity chance. So you can just quickly, you know, say, oh my gosh, something just went off and it's totally wild and we have to look at it tomorrow. Uh, they'll usually try to accommodate that for you. Yeah, so there's lots of different ways we can coordinate this and it, and it really does produce amazing discoveries when, when we can get all these different telescopes working together. And so we've just got time for a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, so one of them, you talked about um, us only seeing maybe a small fraction of some of the black holes that are out there, particularly these intermediate mass black holes. And um, so we had a question come in, um, could these black holes that we maybe don't see explain the, um, the so-called missing mass in galaxies? And um, so could this be an explanation for what we call the dark matter, that extra material we need to make up the mass or, or the black holes um, maybe not fit the bill for that? 
That has been proposed. So uh, black holes that uh, intermediate mass black holes or even a whole bunch of stellar mass black holes, like more than we would expect possibly, have been, ex have been proposed as uh, dark matter candidates or we call them machos, massive compact halo objects. Um, and uh, the statistics that we expect for these black holes don't really fit the bill. We believe the distribution of dark matter might be relatively smooth. Um, in the halo, and that's a relatively new, I mean, it is patchy, but not a bunch of compact objects. And we're getting into territory that I'm not as familiar with, but intermediate mass black holes, hundreds to thousands of stellar masses, because we don't know their origin, uh, it's hard to think of a scenario where there would be hundreds of these things sitting out in the galactic halo that had nothing orbiting them. So they do respond to gravity. That's all the only thing dark matter does respond to. And we don't know yet if globular clusters, so these kind of little blobs of stars that send to orbit the Milky Way in the halo, if they have these black holes in them, so far we haven't seen any. But if they were there in large numbers in our galaxy or Andromeda or nearby galaxies, chances are at least a few of them would be radiating in a way that we could see. Yeah. Now there are these intermediate or these um, ultra luminous X-ray sources in other galaxies that are off center that some people think might be accreting intermediate mass black holes, so it's possible. Um, but as to whether the detailed fits of, of these velocity curves for galaxies match what we would expect, I'm not totally sure. Yeah, so I think uh, what you said is quite important that um, actually black holes, because they're so compact, um, that would predict that the black the dark matter would be very clumpy if it was made of uh, black holes. Um, so maybe that's not consistent with some of the measurements we have of dark matter that shows it being a little bit smoother. So my last question for you tonight, I'm um, thinking about the announcement of the Nobel Prize today. Um, if you had to place a bet on what would be the next Nobel Prize that's won for discoveries related to black holes, um, what would you say it would be? Hmm, uh, that's a good question. I would say if we can get a definitive discovery of, uh, of a primordial seed black hole or a model that predicts seed black holes that matches what we observe in the modern universe, that would be huge. Um, for example, those two different models I talked about, the direct collapse uh, versus the star that doesn't live very long um, versus kind of hierarchical mergers, they predict different fractions of AGN in dwarf galaxies, little galaxies, and this is also might be intermediate mass black holes in these littler galaxies. Uh, and so we're working hard to constrain that, but only recently have we been able to look for those smaller AGN in large numbers. So that would constrain the seed masses. But now that I'm saying, now that since you said the very next one, I actually think it'll be the Event Horizon Telescope, the image that we saw that has the the gold, the, the orange ring. I think that that didn't happen this year because like I said, there's still so much to learn from that image and the interpretation is still taking a while. Um, and that's fine, it's brand new science. Um, but, uh, but I think that will be the very next one is the Event Horizon Telescope image, the, the picture of the black hole, which if you've seen Interstellar or you've seen, you know, it's, it's what was predicted by relativity. It's very beautiful. Yeah, and that, and that really was an amazing, not only scientific achievement, but a technological achievement, being able to produce an image with such exquisite resolution that we can yes. see that, um, that event horizon and just how many teams of scientists around the world work together to make that happen. Um, Absolutely. Amazing. Uh, but yeah, as you say as well, learning where the supermassive black holes come from in the universe um, would be a really profound discovery and really understanding where we came from, where everything around us came from. Um, so yeah, certainly a lot to learn and a lot to look forward to where black holes are concerned. Well, Definitely. thank you very much, Krista, for that fantastic talk tonight. And thank you everyone for joining us. If you want to see that lecture again or any of our past lectures, they're all recorded over on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Kaipak. Otherwise, we'll be back in two weeks time with our next presentation. You can find out more information on our website, kaipak.stanford.edu forward slash discover, where you can also sign up for our mailing list to stay right up to date but we'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>